Um, if, if you're visiting with us today, uh, please know that, that I'm a pinch hitter. And pinch hitters in baseball usually are kind of old guys who uh, aren't the starters. So please come back next week because you're going to hear, want to hear the real preacher next week, uh, our good friend Tyler. Uh, so please do come back. And, and if you are visiting, we're so grateful that you're here. So, some things uh, are appreciated more through, through experience. Uh, a heart knowledge more than what we are able to know in our heads. The kind of things that leave a lasting impression on us. So it's one thing to read and learn about, about how leaves change their colors. Uh, that kind of environmental science is important. But it's something altogether uh, different to drive to the mountains in the fall and see the beauty of the leaves, take in the, uh, the glory of God. You, you can learn about how light rays uh, get scattered through the atmosphere in the evening sky, create colors. Uh, the meteorology of that's important, but it's altogether different uh, to see a magnificent sunset, to take in the beauty of it, experience the grandeur of God. The most important parts of our faith are like that. One theologian said, faith is, is better caught than it is taught. Uh, that is, it's better learned through the experience of our hearts in our everyday lives. Things like the gravity of sin, how it divides people from each other, how it separates them from God, and how it creates a conflict that, that lives within our hearts. And things like the reality of God's grace, an almost unimaginable, unlimited love that, that overcomes the separation, that welcomes people into the family of God, and that can, can bring people who are divided together. It's one thing to know about God's love in your head, in your mind, and it's completely different when you let yourself experience it in your heart, especially right at the point of whatever needs that you have. The Apostle Paul knew all about in his own life that sin abounds in this world. But he also knew the greater truth that God's grace abounds even more. He knew that by his experience, and he wrote about it in Romans 5.20. He'd come face to face with the very depths of his sinfulness, the, the pride of selfishness and self-centeredness, and the, the anger of self-righteousness that divided him from other people, the divisiveness that it caused. It was destroying his life, and it led him to want to destroy everyone else around him who did not agree with him. And he was determined, we know, to stamp out the first followers of Jesus and to end that heresy. And then we know on the road to Damascus, on this hate-filled mission that he was on, that right in the midst of that, he came face to face with Jesus, the risen Christ, the one that he had turned completely away from, was the one who turned fully towards him. And he was struck by this grace in spite of his sins, in the midst of his sinfulness, he found himself accepted and loved and forgiven. The pain of the shame of his life, the searing unworthiness that pervaded his life began to melt away under the warmth of this grace. And the experience and the power of 
of that kind of love changed his life. Paul Tillich is uh, one of the great theologians of the church. He's a wise and he's a kind-hearted Lutheran pastor. And he said it this way, grace strikes us when we are in great pain. That's where it strikes us. Sometimes it's at that moment a wave of light breaks into the darkness of our lives, and it's as though a voice says, you are accepted. You are accepted. And you are not alone. Do not be afraid, because you are loved. Welcome home, my child. That's how Tillich described what Paul was trying to say in these passages. And so Paul continued to struggle with his sinful nature like like I do every day, and like maybe you do. But he knew from that point forward beyond any shadow of a doubt that he was forever a part of God's family. And he knew that that nothing could, could ever separate him from this vast love of Jesus. And he wrote about that in Romans 8, uh, 35 to, to the end of that chapter. So Paul uh, took this, made the rest of his life about spreading this gospel, this kind of good news. And, and we know his particular mission was to the Gentiles. Before he met this grace of God, that would have been absolutely unthinkable. I mean, these were the despised outsiders we know. And then after his experience with grace, they became the insiders, welcomed by the same grace that had saved him. And so in our passage today that Jonathan read for us, Paul's prayers for the believers of the church, that they would grow more and more in their experience, in their heart knowledge, of what this grace of God really meant. And he yearned for them to experience this this limitless love of Christ for them right in the midst of their sinfulness, in spite of all that they had done that they should not have done, and to be changed and to be transformed inside of their lives just like he had been. And so that's his prayer for the church. In Ephesians 4, uh, uh, Jonathan read that beautifully for us, and and I wanted to to reread it for you again in the New Living Translation. This is a a translation that Bonnie and I read uh, every night, and and it speaks, uh, speaks clearly. And so Paul said, when I think of the of the wisdom and the scope of God's plan. I fall to my knees. Literally, he's so yearning for the people that he just falls flat on his face, he's saying. I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father. The creator of heaven and earth, and I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, He will give you mighty inner strength through His Holy Spirit. And I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your heart as you trust Him. May the roots, may your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep His love really is. And may you experience the love of Christ. Though it's so great, you'll never fully understand it. And then you will be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And so Paul is saying in this passage, this is the goal. This is the entire goal of the follower of Jesus, to keep growing more and more in this kind of faith. 
That is to trust His forgiveness of you. To trust His grace for you. And to let it have more and more sway in how you live your life. To accept this almost unimaginable kind of gift from your Father in heaven. And then to share it, to share it far and wide wherever you go. And so Paul, uh, in the passage, begins the passage by describing God as the Father. The word he used there for Father, uh, that's a family term. Uh, it's very similar to, the, to the, uh, the way Jesus described God. You know how he did that, don't you? You know. He described God as his Abba. Dearest Father, Daddy. And so Paul says the one who knows the truth of your life, the one who, who knows everything there is to know about your life, is your Father. And He is the one who says, you belong to me. In spite of all of your sinfulness, in spite of all the flaws of your life, in the midst of all of your brokenness, you are a part of my family, God is wanting to say. And so Paul prayed that the people of the church would make more and more room in their hearts for the indwelling Christ. That they could know the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit within them to give them strength beyond themselves in the midst of all of the threats and the anxieties that they were facing. And then Paul goes on to use metaphors to describe this love of God for the church. He says it's, it's the soil in which a plant can grow and flourish and thrive. And he said it's the solid ground, the foundation, the cornerstone on which you on which a building is built and stands firm. And the RSV says, be rooted and grounded in love. In the New Living Translation, he says, let the roots of your soil sink deep. Let the roots of your soul sink deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And then at the end of his prayer, uh, Paul piles words right up on top of words to describe this all-encompassing love of Christ. How high and, and how deep does this, does this love of Christ extend? How far and how wide does this mercy of God go? And Paul is saying here that no one is outside or beyond the scope the reach of Christ's love. No one. No one. And he kept urging the members of the church to experience for themselves in their hearts this limitless love of Christ. To anchor their lives in this mercy. And so they could know the peace in their own heart that was sometimes torn by inner struggle. And to know the power of this kind of, of love that can, can bring divided people together. And so they can experience the fullness of life that God intends. And then to go out and share it far and wide with everyone that they met. So they too could experience the life-changing power of this kind of mercy. And so Paul's prayer for the early church, that was it, uh, would be the same for our church, for churches in our community and around this world indeed. The long reach of God's grace is meant for church members like us, like you sitting here this morning or watching online. 
a wave of light wanting to break into some darkness that you might be experiencing or feeling. And He intends for you and me to share this expansive, limitless kind of of love far and wide, especially to the forgotten ones, so that they too can be brought into this family. Fred Craddock is a, is a great preaching professor. Uh, they call preaching homiletics in seminaries. Uh, years ago, he was teaching in Oklahoma. And when the semester was over, he and his wife uh, went back to their home in Tennessee to Gatlinburg to, to enjoy some time off. And they went to a restaurant there, and, and they were sitting enjoying a, a quiet meal together. And they noticed this, this white-haired old man going from table to table. Uh, Jack, that could have been me, couldn't it? Uh, and, and so he was going from table to table and uh, talking to people. Uh, turns out he's the maitre d of the restaurant. And as Dr. Craddock told the story, he said, I sure hope he doesn't stop at our table. Uh, but sure enough, he made his way right to us. Where are you from, the the maitre d' asked. Uh, Ada, Oklahoma. And he said, well, what do you do? And Craddock said, I teach homiletics in seminary, thinking that I'd throw him off, that this old mountain man wouldn't know what that meant. Oh, he said, you teach preaching. I've got a preacher's story for you. And with that, he sat down at our table. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've heard all the preacher stories I ever want to hear in a lifetime. But the old maitre d' began. I was born across the mountain, he said, and and my mother wasn't married. I never knew my father. We both felt the shame of it. And as long as I remember, people looked down on us. They called me by a name that started with B. And I'd never heard that word before. The worst thing was, when my mother and I went to town, people would put their hands over their mouths. And they would talk. But I could hear them. I wonder who his daddy is. I wonder who he belongs to. We didn't go to church because we knew what people would say. What are trash like that doing in a holy place like this? They don't belong here. I was 14 when a new preacher came to town, to the little mountain church, and he was kind. And he was wise, and I was taken by him. And I began to go to church, and I'd sit on the back row, and and I made my way out before the service was over because I didn't want anybody accusing me of being in the wrong place. But one Sunday I was so into the sermon that I lost track of time and the service was over before I realized it. And I I tried to scurry out into the back, but there were a bunch of ladies there and I couldn't get out. And there I was, an unworthy person in this holy place. And I was so anxious, waiting to make my escape. And as I was standing there, I felt a hand tapping me on the shoulder And I turned around, and who was it but the preacher himself? And he said, whose child are you, son? Who's your daddy? It was the question that haunted me my whole life. And I didn't know the answer. And I didn't know what to say. And I stood there with tears in my eyes. And before I could say anything, the preacher said, Wait a minute. You don't have to tell me. Why, of course, I already know. You are a son. You are a child of God. God is your daddy. Young man, you've got a great heritage, and you're a part of a wonderful family. You are loved by this Father God of yours more than you could ever imagine. And I want you to go into the world 
and claim that for yourself. And then the old maitre d' said, I don't want to be overly dramatic, but those two phrases, you are a, you are a son of God, that God is your daddy, were the most incredible things anyone had ever said to me in my whole life. And very frankly, to know that I belong to God, that someone like me could be loved by Him, changed the whole course of my life. Well, by this time, Craddock was absolutely captivated by this man's story. And he said, what did you say your name was? And he said, my name is, is Ben Hooper. And then Craddock remembered that years ago, his, his grandfather had told him that twice the people of Tennessee had elected as their governor a man who had been born out of wedlock, that very same man who was sitting next to him. By claiming his heritage as a child of God, by embracing in his heart the love of his heavenly Father, communicated first to him by this preacher and then many others, it gave him a whole new sense of how he saw his life. He was struck by grace, and it changed how he lived his whole life. This morning, maybe some of you have wondered if God could really accept someone like me. In spite of all that's gone on in my life, in the midst of whatever that you've been dealing with, maybe God is wanting you to hear His voice speaking to you right at the point of your need about the vast, vast love of Jesus. That the gift is for you. Maybe God is speaking to you this morning, wanting you to open your heart more fully and to make more room in your heart for the indwelling Christ and to know His love for you more fully. As well, God is certainly calling you and me through this prayer to be messengers of His grace, to extend His mercy far and wide to love like we've been loved, to forgive like we've been forgiven, and to help other people experience this life-changing power for themselves. Paulina is a young woman that, that, that Bonnie and I have met, that our son John knows, and she came from a shattered family. As a young girl, she felt the pain deep in her heart that no one cared about her. And the shame of feeling unloved and unworthy. Her father was imprisoned for abusing her mother. And her mother remarried, and, and that marriage also ended badly in divorce. And Paulina said, I was angry, and I was hurting, and I did things I shouldn't have done, and I needed to know that someone loved me. Well, her mother couldn't take care of her anymore, and, and she sent her to live at Baptist Children's Home over there in Thomasville. And she was met by some cottage parents who welcomed her. And she said, they stood by me in the darkest and the lowest times of my life. And they let me know by the words they said and the things they did that they cared about me. I didn't know much about God when I got there. I didn't know what unconditional love was until I experienced it firsthand. My cottage parents told me about the love of Jesus. They showed me by the way they lived. And one day I accepted Christ into my life. And I'll always remember that moment because I felt so loved. Discovering that kind of love changed Paulina's life. and She went on to college and earned a master's degree at UNC. And today she's a 32-year-old woman 
sharing God's grace with hurting people as a licensed clinical social worker. She said, my dream is to keep giving back, to make a difference for other people, just like others made a difference for me. Well, if there was ever a dream for you and me in our church as followers of Christ, that would be it. Today, this week, keep opening your heart more and more to the indwelling Christ within you, to God's grace for you, and make it real for somebody else. Thanks be to God. Amen.